You're listening to the Freedom Talk Radio Network on Blog Talk Radio. Hi, welcome to Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. Our show will start in just a moment, but first I want to tell you that today's program starts with a pre-recorded interview in the first hour. Our second hour is live, which includes answering emails and possibly taking your calls. So please stay tuned. Now let's get started. Welcome to Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio with your host, Kay William Spencer, and friends. This program is here to help all of us understand our journey in and through life by means of straightforward conversations, discussions, guest interviews, and listener emails. For more information, visit our site at ytyrradio.tk. Now, here's your host. Hello and welcome to Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. This is Kirk Spencer, your host. My guest today is Marilyn Lawrence. She is a book author. Her book is From Pink to Blue. She's explained that to us a little bit. Uh, she's also writing a children's book at the present time. And in her past, she has been a real estate, a residential real estate broker, uh, agent, I believe. And she's also a public speaker. So welcome to the show, Marilyn. Thank you so much, Kurt. It's a pleasure being with you. Uh, definitely. It's good to have you here. Uh, so tell us about this book, From Pink to Blue. You know, we talked about it a little bit before we got on air, but you know, I preferred that you just tell us all at one time. Fresh, what's the book about and the unique title? <laughs> I know you were taken back a little bit when I gave you the title of the book, From Pink to Blue. It is a book about life purpose, basically. I was given messages as I have with all of the books that I'm writing. And this one in particular is about the importance of supporting children as soon as they're born with the, their purpose that they bring to this life. It's my belief, and I, I demonstrate that in the words in this book, that children pick their purposes before entering the life. It's, so it's that purpose, which I call truth of being. It's the truths that are part of their being that need to be supported. And unfortunately, what we've done for centuries is we've taken children off of their path. We've uh, redirected them to something that's comfortable for us. Parents are comfortable acting or doing one thing, so they kind of change their children to conform to their own reality instead of uh, supporting the children. Supporting the child and saying, you know, I believe in whatever it is that you are here to do. So that's a, it's a very, very important concept. And I think in doing that, Kirk, we're going to be able to thrust society forward in unmeasurable amounts. If every person comes to this life, supports the reason that they're supposed to be here, it's going to be um, basically orchestrating greatness. So the title from pink to blue in, in, uh, <laughs> interestingly enough, has nothing to do with that. But after interviewing several different children, by about the fourth, fourth little girl stories, and, and I have to tell you, it was the sweetest thing interviewing children. I interviewed children from uh, four to ten in that age range, and I asked them a series of questions. Uh, what did they want to be when they were little, you know, and, and for adults to think uh, of a four-year-old talking about when they were little. But, but each one definitely had answers. And then I asked them what they wanted to be today when they grow up. I asked them uh, what their favorite colors were. It's just a series of questions. I wanted to get a feel of, of what these children, why there was a change in children to kind of help demonstrate this, this uh, concept. And by about the fourth little girl who had um, received a, an immense amount of peer pressure, some of these little children, they said their favorite color used to be pink, but they changed it to blue because they were made fun of for being a baby, liking pink and liking princesses. So as soon as that, um, <laughs> as soon as that was uh, made so clear to me, the title, of course, had to be From Pink to Blue. Ah, now that makes sense. Okay. Actually, I'm glad to hear that this book, I'm going to have to get this book from you, but um, the reason why I say that is because uh, I've been a school teacher for many years, off and on, 
and uh, uh, used to tell parents, and occasionally I still do, but I don't parents too much anymore, is that I believe, and this has always been my belief, that our role as a parent, in my role as a teacher, is not to tell a student what their future is supposed to be. I my feeling is has always been as a parent because I have two grown children myself uh is to help these children to become responsible adults and what I mean by responsible is is you live in a community so you take responsibility for your own actions and you're not one who lives by yourself so how do I function where do I find my place in the society or the community that I live in. But uh, it's also to find what is your purpose. And I have, I've, I've always had fights with my family on that one. What is your purpose? Oh, well, my idea of success was uh, go to school, get an education, and get a job where you can have a secretary in an air-conditioned office. <laughs> that was her goal. My father was, I don't care what you do, as long as you do something. Mm-hmm. Two different right. ways of thinking. Two different ways of thinking and actually two different ways of support. Yeah. And that, I think that that's what, what has happened a lot. Just, you know, a lot of convergent thinking. You've got these children coming into parents that, by no fault of their own, are unaware that, that they need to support individual children. You know, you hear parents saying, gosh, my kids are different as night and day. Well, of course they are. Everyone comes with their own individual path. Their own mate to this concept of knowingness of starting out from birth. When, when women are pregnant, they need to be talking to their child and saying, I believe in you. I know that you're coming for a specific reason and I will support you. I will be here to help you. And we've got to do that. We've got to do that with children. And what's happening now is that the parents uh, train them to be to be conforming to their family role. And then they go to school because the classrooms are overloaded and the teachers are conforming their thoughts. You know, you have to act this way and test this way and this is the correct answer. And instead of... Um, you know, allowing the creativity of the individual character to flow. So it's a, it's a huge thing. It's not going to be an overnight process, Chris, but it's something that has to begin. Oh, yeah. There is something that, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the societies that we live in, especially in the United States, uh, and to certain degrees down here in Mexico, the what is normally considered to be the natives of the country, those who were here before the Europeans came. Um, the in this case, the indigenous people, which we they actually prefer to be called as the indigenous people, is um, I used to live with the Native Americans or the indigenous people for a while, and I actually have a name that was given to me by them. And this is something that you can even find on YouTube. But they talk about leadership within the tribe or the tribal system. And it says the way that it's taught in, well, at least the way that they live it, it's just interesting to talk about it, uh, is that uh, in comparison to the uh, European system of monarchy, it's a blood lineage within ways of doing things. It's a point of we watch the children and you can watch the children as they play and you will notice who is the natural leader Uh within Uh their age group and they take that natural leader and they're the ones who teach that child how to lead and how to be um, if you will the, uh, the, the future leader of the tribe the future chief of the tribe and uh, yet, yeah, to a certain degree, there's some blood lineage to it, but it still looks at it as being, this is the leader, this is the warrior, this is the, if you will, the medicine man, the one who understands more about life than just the leadership roles. In other words, they take w- what the ability of the child is and they hone it for the future. Right. 
Right. It's a, it's that simple task, taking the time really to identify, oh, there are different personalities and we need to support that. That's a beautiful thing. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we've fallen away from, in my opinion. Yep. So yep. That's, this is so, that's why this concept of supporting, um, supporting individual uh, truth, truth of being is huge. And interestingly enough, I was bouncing this idea off friends in the book and having it published and instead of having those adults who all had children talk about how that had a, would affect their children they talked about themselves and they regressed to their childhood and each of them and again a couple of the adults were in tears talking about how they themselves remembered incidents of being taken off their path of being teased and you know bullied into uh, something that's popular with the, the peers around them. Something, uh, you know, in some cases not even talking too much because they didn't want to be teased anymore. So it's, it's an interesting thing what's happened with these adults. In fact, it was that that prompted me to write at the end of the book a, a, um, a few questions to help prompt people to remember what their truths are because that's the biggest question that I get asked by adults. How do I know what I'm here to do? How do I remember my purpose? So I have written in the book a few questions that help prompt that memory back because you, everyone still has that. It's part of the matrix of your life. It's part of, it's part of your truth of being. It's inside of you. It's just been tucked down so much because of the teasing or because of the non-support that it's sometimes a little difficult to bring forward and to remember. But with with the correct prompting, you can pull it out. In fact, I remember um, this is one of my most interesting conversations with a gentleman in L.A. He's a pretty prominent attorney, and he has a successful career. And he kind of, um, in a, a almost a, um, a ridiculing fashion, said to me, well, I wanted to be Superman when I grew up, so what do you make of that? thinking, of course, that there would be no way that he could bear a Superman costume and fly around. And and I said, well, well, let's let's think about this. You wanted to be Superman. And right now you are helping a tremendous amount of people. So you're super in that respect and you're flying around. So you are actually flying. He wants to write a book. So I've helped him um, break through a few barriers so that he, he started his book writing now. So it's just interesting to have, or to remember those thoughts. What did I want to be when I was little? A lot of times you're asked around um, first grade, maybe kindergarten, even by family or teachers, what did you want to be when you were little? And you would immediately come up with the answers. Well, those answers are part of your, part of your matrix. So if you wanted to be a doctor, so you're part of the healing family, you know, it's really important to go back, remember what you wanted to be when you were little, and that will help you uh, start pulling up those memories, those truths that were in them. Let me ask you a question. Actually, I'm going to have to ask a bunch of questions here now. <laughs> but um, let's see. Uh, I might have to write these down, but let's see if I can get two of them out, and I'll try to write the other ones down while you're answering these two. Uh, Give us an idea of what you say to people or what questions do you ask people to help them to find what their purpose is. And the second point is, do you believe that there's only one purpose, or can there be multiple purposes for us? Okay, well, I'll answer question number two first because that's so easy. Uh, multiple purposes. Transitions as you get older. And so that's a, a very important purpose right there. Okay. Now, Marilyn, let me stop you because we seem to be having mm-hmm. the same issue with uh, signal problems. You oh. faded out, so could you start again from multiple purposes? Of course. I hate that fading in and out thing. Yeah, so do I. <laughs> See, uh, multiple purposes is because your life does change. You, you're young and you get 
older and, and most people will have um, a parenthood at that time. If you're not a parent, then you be involved. You know, you could be an aunt or uncle. You've got children around you. So that's an important part of your life there is being responsible for children. And now that we've been, um, and I say these, these ideas in all of my books are not my ideas. They're ideas that are gifted to me and I've just made a promise to share them. But the, the important concept now of supporting children is even a bigger purpose in people's lives. I think then you, you get a little older and then you can identify other purposes. So yes, I believe that people have multiple purposes. The, the uh, first question, <laughs> which I can't remember. <laughs> what was the first question again, Kurt? How Sorry. do you, without giving too much from your book, how, how do you get people to realize or to remember the, the purpose for their birth here. In other words, okay, you, you live past birth, you live past high school. That was a deal right there nowadays. But, okay, you got past high school and all the rest of that. Now you're an adult, so what is your purpose? How do you help people find that or reconnect with that? It's it's really interesting, and the, and I touched on it earlier, Just just going back and remembering what it was you said you wanted to be when you grew up. Now, I've run into a lot of adults that say, I don't remember that. I don't remember what I wanted. Nobody asked me what I wanted to be. I just, I can't remember anything. And so I have them go back and think about when they were young, you know, when you're four, when you're a young child, what did you like to play? Did you like to play dress up? Did you like to play doctors? What, what was your favorite thing to play? And so from that, then we can start opening up those, those paths. You know, what it, because most kids will always go to a certain thing that they like to play. In fact, if you watch children playing together, one child is always saying, no, let's play this. And then another one like, no, I want to play this. So, so, you know, it's kind of a, a struggle, uh, with what they're going to play <laughs> each day, but it, that, that helps. From there, then we kind of develop because I'll, I'll run into people that are kind of unsettled in their their careers now. However, let's say let's say we've got someone who's a um, masseuse. That's a, an example of a person I was working with. They said they wanted to be a nurse when they were little. Well, that's still in the healing line. A masseuse is in the healing line. I think they, in that case, she just needed to take it a step further and get into a little bit more body movement, and she's take, now taking a few more classes to to help her feel like she's doing a, a bigger difference to help people. So that's what we do, Kirk, is that's what I do. Rather, is I just help people remember. I just continue to prompt people to remember what their truths are. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me... Now, I guess this is going to sound a little bit more like an interview now, but I'm kind of curious now. Uh, you're saying that you help people to find. Now, I, I'm thinking back to my childhood, and I'm thinking about how the usual answers were, were oh, I want to be a doctor, oh, I want to be a nurse, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a policeman, and we're basing these desires for occupation in future times off of normally what we see that's going on around about us, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, it's more subject to what we see in our lives as a child. Uh, we see policemen, and back then, policemen were a lot more respectable. Uh, a nurse was, you know, because we went to see the doctor, and the nurse was very nice, or... Um, back when I was a child, back in the 50s, this was, you looked at a nurse as, uh, for a woman, I want to be a, a nurse because that is the generally accepted role for a health care giver for a woman. Uh, for a guy, you never really saw a guy being a nurse too much back then in those days. So uh, a kid, a male child would go in and see a doctor. I want to be a doctor. I don't want to be a nurse. I want to be a doctor. Uh, nobody ever said they wanted to be an orderly, but okay. But <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe because they were around a lot of people, oh, I want to be a chef, or I want to be, in other words, it's something that you saw and that you could identify with because you saw the results of that and it was like, oh, this is so cool. You know, I like to eat, so I like to cook, and I learned how to cook, and this is a lot of fun, so 
I want to be a chef. Or you had to go to the doctors, either a lot or a little, but they were always nice to you when you went there. And uh, you always hear your parents or somebody else going, well, oh, they earn a lot of money, so, yeah. so you want to earn the money because you relate that money gives you the things that you want. So, yes, I'll become a doctor, and I can make people smile and earn a lot of money, and so on and so forth down the line. So how does that really equate to... Uh, if you will, a sole purpose? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, you have to know that there are no accidents why you would be having to go to the doctor a lot or, or why you would be around a certain environment more than other. You resonate with that feeling. So, so let's say you're around police a lot. You have to be around that because that resonates with... You've chosen to be around that, basically, because that's part of your purpose. So, so if, a, a, you know, okay, 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 let's say, let's say it's usually three things. They want a fireman, a doctor, and a police officer or something. It's all in the healing and the, the guarding and the healing line. So, so of those three things, they're going to resonate. They're going to, they're going to be more drawn to one of those areas. And that comes out in their playing, you know, what they'll play most what they'll be most. So I, in answer to that, that's true, but there are no accidents. There's, there are, there are reasons that you are around the situations that you're around because that will help with your memory and that will help form the information that you'll need in your future. In other words, there's no such thing as a coincidence. <laughs> there's not. I don't believe in that at all. I think that exactly. every, I think the only coincidence is if, the only accident is if you don't pay attention. Mm -hmm. um, you made me think of something else here, and I'm going to start with this. Now, I give you a personal experience. As okay. a child, my father created uh, in the house that they had... I was about a year old when he bought this house, so I don't remember the purchase of it. But I remember as a child, uh, he was always making changes within the house, so on and so forth. And at one point, he actually created what we called back then was a sandbox. I don't know if kids these days know what a sandbox is, but he created a sandbox. And uh, it was something that uh, it was in free to invite the kids in it. So we used to play in the sandbox. Yeah, we were still under 10 years old, so it was cool. Besides, back then, and nobody had computer games. Computers were still the big boxy things. You know, card readers and all the rest of that. So, um, no video games, nothing along those lines. So, it was outside. On your bicycle, play with your toys, whatever, but it was outside. You didn't play in the house when I was a kid. Uh, so we used to invite the kids over in the neighborhood, and my brother, who was 10 years older than me, uh, he used to remark, and he would still remark to this for many, many years afterwards, he would say, I would notice how you would play with the other kids in the neighborhood. And he says, you would be the leader, and they would, whatever you said, they would do. You were the natural leader. And for me, I've always had a difficult time actually identifying myself as a leader for anything. But it was always, I found in my lifetime, professional and otherwise, that leadership roles always seem to just kind of plop into my lap. So I always seemed to be, I didn't want to myself, these eventually learned to accept the role that okay, this is it. And the ironic part about this is is that even to this day, even when I try to make it a, this is a group situation, this is a group purpose, I don't even really want to be, quote, quote, the leader. It's just, it's a de let democracy rule. It seems to be that I am still the one who is considered to be, whether it's official or unofficial, the leader. Uh-huh, uh -huh. And I'm going well, to go from there, but go ahead. I want to hear your uh, your thoughts on that. Well, I just have to laugh. The reluctant leader. So, so you've had, you know, that's been identified um, with you since <laughs> a child, 
your brother identified that as part of your character, part of your truth of being as a child. So you've had that information. You've just been reluctant to accept that role. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's a lot of truth to that. And, there, you know, the fact that you're now doing what you're doing. You're the leader of this whole radio, and you're um, spreading the word of so many people out to the world, and, and that's a huge role for a leader. So I think that um, I, I'm happy to hear that you're embracing that now, and, and I think that you need to just just realize that that is a definitely part of your purpose, and you need to just yeah. pull it. Some up. things you just have to learn to accept. You see either that or you end up fighting it for the rest of your life, and why bother to fight it? So. Well, you come back and have to learn the same lesson in the next life. So <laughs> exactly, <laughs> take care of it now. Exactly. Now, the other part of this is now you were talking about the Superman thing, and yes, mm -hmm. he was being uh, more facetious and kind of taunting you on that. Okay, that's where I was getting more to the thing of okay. Uh, on TV as a child, yes, we grew up with Superman, with George Reeves and a few other people. And then as we got into the older ages, then uh, uh, I forget the guy's first name, uh, the one who actually made the the movie in the 70s uh, fell off the horse and he died just yeah. a few years ago. His last name was Reeves on top of that. So, <laughs> But... Um, yeah, the Superman thing was it was one of those popular things from the 50s when I was a child. There was also the Invisible Man and uh, yeah, so on and so forth. So and there was a lot of those TV roles that were de helping to develop, uh, if you will, visual images in the children of our day. You know, that was about the only time we were inside is to watch these particular shows. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So... We tend to I find something in our lives, whether it's uh, I'm still kind of picking at this, but I'm I'm hoping that you'll round this out for me. Okay. Is that uh, we see things in life, whether they are uh, something that we see in life real, or something that we see in, on a screen. As I didn't want to just say television because nowadays uh, we can look at a computer and see everything that we want to see, including news and everything else. So it's not just a television anymore. We can see it on a screen. So we identify with what we see in screen, in books, uh, and in real life. So with that <laughs> identifying, some of these things we want to be this and you know, kids are putting on their little costumes and they're playing Superman or now the Green Lantern or um, Transformers. Okay, we can't be a Transformer. We're not mechanical. But, <laughs> uh -huh. <laughs> you know, and I don't know the video games that are out there, but, you know, they're identifying with these roles. And unfortunately, the sad part about a lot of these video games, especially the popular ones, is that they're very violent. So, um, how do you see that playing within the role of of children? Um, maybe are they actually contradictory to each other, or do they play hand in hand? How do you see that? Well, I see I see it twofold. You know, there's there's just simple playing, there's simple uh, identifying with whatever is popular at the time. It's those children that stay with that, that embrace it fully. They are then realizing it's, it's connecting inside of them. It's registering inside of them with something that's part of their woven truth. So a, a lot of children can go out and play, um, let's say the new Superman movie comes out and, and it's a blockbuster, and so all the children are out playing Superman. It's the child that that is constantly the Superman that always wants to wear that suit around the house. Most of the other kids will take it off and that will be a little face for them and, and they'll be onto something else. So, so it's, it's something that, that will register deeper. The, the child's just playing the role will then move on and play construction trucks or something. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. So, so every child is going to be playing with, with the different things. It, it's identifying what stays with them, what registers deeper in children, 
Look, look the gentleman, since we're talking about Superman, the gentleman that that, um, that I was helping with this identification of, of Superman, I told him part of his assignment was to print or get Superman T-shirts, you know, the big F on mm-hmm. the chest, and wear it underneath his suit every day. And when he was starting to doubt himself, I wanted him to go into the bathroom and open up his, his shirt and flash that Superman T-shirt to himself. And, you know, I didn't know if he would do that or not. That's a pretty interesting assignment for a prominent attorney, but he did it. And now down at the bottom of his um, email signature is the big ass Superman ass. So he's very much embracing his truth, and it, it's a wonderful thing to see. He's, like I mentioned, he's working on his book. So I think that once you help someone unlock those secrets that they've been hiding about themselves, and they call, and I call it secrets because they've had to hide it so they wouldn't be teased. Mm-hmm. So once you help them unlock those secrets and and show them that they can be confident with that information, then they just start blooming. It's like the, the person that goes to work every day and they hate their job. I hate my job. Ugh. In fact, I, I was working with one gentleman. He actually threw up some mornings before he got in his vehicle because he just did not want to go to work. But that's a clear-cut example of working out of your, your purpose path. Mm-hmm. You're working something that's not registering with you. You're, you're so focused on having to earn an income that you've given up on every reason that you're sitting here. So it's time to get, you know, open up your thought process again, open up your truth, get back on your purpose path, and then you'll find the joy. You'll find the excitement of going to work again. You, you don't have to worry about money because when you are working in your purpose path, money will flow. It's when you aren't working in your purpose path that you're working just for the money and not for your purpose. All right, Marilyn, I'm going to stop you right there because we have to take a commercial break. I'm going to come back. We're going to continue this, and uh, I'm enjoying this new show process already. So, anyway, stay tuned with us, people. We'll be right back with Marilyn Lawrence, the author of From Pink to Blue. We'll be right back. Ladies, have you or someone you know been stood up on your wedding day or just before that special day? How did you feel that day or afterward? Here is one heart-rending book about one woman's bright and wonderful day and future turned dark and ugly and how she got through it. Happily Never After by Mona is the book for those that have had the experience of heartbreak at the altar or just before being left with a bouquet, tears, and embarrassment. Happily Never After by Mona, even for men to know the long-term pain you may cause and may experience later in life. Where to buy Happily Ever After can be found at happilyneverafter.info. That's happilyneverafter.info. Hi, this is Kay William Spencer of Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. Join us every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern on Freedom Talk Radio for enlightening, humorous, and intriguing conversations that I have with my co-host and or our guest, all to help you look at life and your choices differently. For more information, go to ytyrradio.tk or if you prefer, ytyrradio.wordpress.com. Join us. The Perinoid 01 and friends in the Mantra Cave on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Chakra Khan. Get a one-of-a-kind comedic reading or mantra from Mr. Perry. Have your snacks ready early and set your alarm for Friday night at 11 p.m. Central and prepare yourself for 30 minutes of fun. Call in early and beat the rush at 347-637-1932. All readings for entertainment only. Hi, and welcome back. Our guest today here on Your Thought, Your Reality Radio is Marilyn Lawrence, the author of From Pink to Blue. And she, as I said earlier, she's also writing a children's book. But recently, just before the break, we were talking about uh, soul's purpose and uh, what is your purpose in life. Uh, we were ending up with uh, a point where a lot of us, I believe, can relate to the point of having a job versus actually working your purpose. And that was pretty much what Marilyn was talking about. And um, 
I want to get back to a question here real quick because uh, I don't want to put you on a spot, so I'll ask the question and I'll give you an answer. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a question the way we always used to ask, and you were talking about this before the break, about this guy says, I always wanted to be Superman. And I love what you were talking about with telling him to go buy a shirt and put it underneath his suit and his shirt and jacket. And if you're having any questions, go to the restroom and pop open the thing like you see even in the cartoons or in the movies and pop open your shirt and just go, yes, I am. And this part of dressing the part of who you are, even uh -huh. though here I work at home, uh, when I actually get into doing uh, interviews and whatnot, I even dress the part of doing an interview. That doesn't mean I put on a suit and a tie. It just means I get, I work at home. So, I mean, sometimes I sit here and work in my PJs for whatever it's worth. But when I'm doing something professional, I can't sit here in my PJs and do something professional. It's just, it seems to go contradictory to how I'm actually living my life. So I actually get dressed into something that's more of a at least uh, dress casual type of a thing. So... The question that we always asked people, uh, especially when I was younger, was, what's the difference between Superman and Batman? You want to venture with that one, or should I just go ahead and give the answer? Wow, yeah. I, I would have to roll that over a little bit, and I think that you can, you can uh, okay. answer that while I'm on my answer. Okay. Well, if you have never heard it, I, it would be an unfair thing to do on the air. But at any rate, the, the question <laughs> is, what's the difference between Superman and Batman? The difference between Superman and Batman is Superman puts on a costume to blend into society where Batman blends into society because he's just an average human being who happens to be a crime fighter, where Superman takes off the costume to be himself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you're... It, the way that I'm looking at the way that you were telling this attorney was you are someone that is above in some respects, not superior to, but uh, that has, as shall we say, super abilities or you have some abilities that are far better or far greater than the average. Okay. And I say that because uh, part of my life, you know, I think we talked about this uh, off air, probably even last week, is the fact that I'm a Qigong master. Qigong, for most people, don't know what it means. Qigong is, the, in short term, in very easy terms, is the ability to move energy, which some people think is really strange or no, it's not possible. Energy and moves, excuse me, energy exists everywhere. And consciousness is what makes the energy move. This you can find from quantum mechanics, quantum physics, and they'll tell you that energy is everywhere. You know that, as a matter of fact. Everybody knows that. I'm not talking about just you, Marilyn. But everybody knows that energy is everywhere. Okay? Sun is energy. We talk about sun solar flares. It's the energy that comes from the sun, and it comes down here. It affects equipment, it affects human beings, so on and so forth. But we also know that energy is something that we don't create, nor can we destroy energy. So, the most we can do with energy is manipulate it, such as like uh, a magnet, a magnet with another magnet, a magnet with a piece of metal, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, an MRI machine is energy and sends energy through your body and it reads what is going on with your body or in your body so on and so forth. So we know that energy is there, but quantum physics and quantum mechanics is telling you that energy will just sit there dormant unless there is something to move it. So what moves energy? And they're saying it's conscious thought that moves energy. So this is what basically, you know, long, I gave it longer than I actually intended to, but this is what Qigong, Tai Chi, Reiki, and all the rest of these are really are, is the ability to move energy. Now, I do this quite often, and as I found, as I continue to study it, I don't have to be in the room, I don't have to be in the same building, the same city, the same country, the same continent to work energy for someone else that needs it. Mm -hmm. So in some respects, 
Okay, yes, I like Superman, but I never saw Superman do any of the, that in any of the series, any of the books, or any of the movies that I've seen. But it's a capability that we all have. So what I'm getting at in short term is I always used to say this, especially in my late teens and my 20s and into my 30s, and uh, when people were always challenging me, well, how can you do this, why do you do this, and so on and so forth, is... I always say this, and I have another website that's up because I did holistic therapies for a number of years, a <laughs> number of years for over 30 years. Uh, I would tell people that while everybody else is sitting up here saying, no, that can't be done, I was the one who was doing it or asking, why not, and going to find out what are my limitations. I don't like people to give me limitations, and I just believe it. I have to find out, have is that... heard that leader thing? Pardon, Kurt, pardon me? Heard that leader? There's another, there's another um, uh, identification of your leadership right there. <laughs> <laughs> is that really it? Okay. <laughs> Sometimes I can't see that because I'm living it. But, yeah, it was just a point of, is that something that I have to live with or do is there another way? And that's the way I always look at life. And, and I, I found many different ways that make people go... Wow, how did you do that? And I go, I don't set limitations for myself in that respect. So, what is your opinion on that? I 100%, of course I 100% agree with that. I I believe everything you say and do is going to manifest in your life. So you have to be um, acutely conscious of, of your actions. And if you limit yourself in your thinking and your actions, Therefore, you have a limited life. I think it's a very simple um, concept that that people have to live with. If you want to open yourself up to everything manifesting for you, then you have to do just that, and you have to do just that, starting the minute you open your eyes to the minute that you you do your chanting to put yourself to sleep. So, I agree with you, uh, but I have to go back to to uh, laughing about your leadership, your reluctant leadership role and how that has obviously been a part of your life and you were, <laughs> you were not aware of it. Hey, well, I, I, I guess you say I'm aware of it and uh, did you ever read the book uh, by Richard Bach, The Illusions, The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I did. I seem yeah. to identify, and I, you can tell I can. I read this book years and years and years ago, and I still remember the title, <laughs> uh -huh. which is usually unusual for me. But I seem to I remember identifying with the story very much, mm -hmm. and um, I guess you could say is I don't know where that's going to take me. So I'm not actually fighting it so much anymore, as I am just like, well, I got into this thing about living the now. And what I mean by living the now is, okay, yesterday was yesterday, so I, I, I either learned something from that or it was just something that wasn't supposed to be learned, and it was just, in other words, another, another day. But there's always something to learn from something every day. And the future is something that I plan for, and this is something I even just wrote about in my blog uh, about a week ago or so. Um mistaking concern for my future as something that was positive when I was actually just get fooling myself by saying that concern is not fear-based when it was actually fear-based. And when you understand that fear is actually working against us, okay, I wasn't sure if it was you or your husband or somebody else has just said it recently, even though it's something that I've lived, learned a long time ago, Fear is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. Of course, everybody mm -hmm. else knows it as um, forget everything and run. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's variations of that one, but that was the nice clean one. But uh, <laughs> forget everything and run. No, but it's actually, in, in reality, it's false evidence appearing real. And... This is something that we need to understand is that we 
we can look at the future, we can plan for the future. What are your plans? We're hopefully that they're going to be something that's positive. But if you're going to be fearful about anything in the future, you're actually bringing that into your now, and it will affect your future. So the future yeah, is the next second. <laughs> It's a very interesting that you, um, and I think we touched on this when we spoke last week, but the, the, you're, con- you're thinking of now, and you wrote a blog on now, because that, that angel book that I'm writing right now, now, um, those, I'm, what I'm doing is I'm channeling angel messages to write this angel book, and they told me that we have to live in now, and if we think about the past, it is then our now, if we think about the future, if we live in our future, then it is our now. So be very conscious of our now. We have to be very conscious of the now that we're living. Mm-hmm. If we spend all of our time thinking about past and, and oh, why did I do that or why did that person do that to me or something, that is the now that we're living. So we have to be very conscious of our now and be, be active, actively conscious of our now. In other words, control the thoughts that you have so that the now that you're living is the one that you want to live and not one that you used to live or one that you think that you're going to live in the future, but the one that you want to live today. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Well, let me see. Before we move on, um, I don't know if I really want to go here. I wanted to just mention one thing, Kurt. Go ahead. It's It's okay. Go ahead. But th- th- I have to go back to um, you making mention of the book that you'd read, and you seldom remember the title of it. I'm just finding some humor in this. Um, what I'm seeing with you is a realization of how you've, uh, because like we talked about with little children, they play a lot of different games, but the children will always stay with one or two that are their their favorite ones. And you have done the same thing. You know, you remember the title of that book. You always kind of, in every different life path that you've followed, you've moved into a leadership position, basically, with it. So it's interesting when you um, spend some time thinking back on your different um, scenarios in your life, just like everyone that I work with does, they'll realize how much time they've spent in the leadership role. And when they do that, then all of a sudden, it's like this big this big uh, shell falls off of them as though they've been living in an egg shell. The shell just starts cracking away from them and opens them up. It's almost like floating into their purpose. It's just a beautiful thing to watch. Yeah. <laughs> well, I was having a long conversation with one of my co-hosts this morning, so we were kind of getting into that aspect as well, but uh, we don't have a lot of time to get into that. Um let me ask you in one quickie question. Do you, you were talking about channeling in, from angel messages and whatnot. Have you ever gotten into an understanding of soul ages or the age of the soul? I have my own personal opinion, uh, but I have not reached on that yet um, with the angels. I this, this book that I'm currently writing this is, an interview is uh, week. profound. I, I'm constantly now, moved with the message that they and give me. I do I believe that, of course, we have um, which is the many lives. And the more the, the more times we put off our, our purpose, let's say, say that uh, let's say that you didn't realize that you were here to be a leader for different so different movements, um, you would then have to come back again and, and relearn that. We live a life to teach you that lesson. Mm-hmm. But I I can't speak um, I can't speak for the angel realm because I haven't asked that question of them yet. All right, you so well. We'll talk about that. I've already written that. Uh, that got ten minutes to go. Ten minutes to go, give or take. And you said you wanted to talk about something in Delph, uh, in particular. I just wanted to make mention of the. Uh, I am so passionately um, supporting this concept that was gifted to me, as you know, of supporting children. I that I intertwine this okay, message but. throughout my books. I've got uh, one in editing right now. It's that's entitled A Donovan's Memory, in which this same um, message is. The angel book that I'm currently writing is 
supporting this concept and, and I feel that it's such a hugely important concept that I want to uh, send it out to as many different audiences as I can. So that's a, it's just a really important thing and I think the more that we spread it, Kirk, you know, I talk to you and then you'll talk to someone else and, you know, just the spreading of it, hopefully it'll become a virus and we'll be able to see this this world of ours making this shift, this beautiful enlightened shift into recognizing that advancements can be endless. So that's that's basically what I want to say is it's just please please share, please do it, please please uh, passionately embrace this as much as I do. Oh yeah, you're definitely coming back, even if I have to come all the way up there to Oregon and put you on a computer <laughs> so but the nice thing about this is is that uh, for those who are listening uh, one of our future shows will be with Marilyn and her husband Dale and um, he is I would say in his own way equally as interesting and he has his own message to bring and um it's, it's just put it this way. You put the two of these people together, you end up with a great show because they're just some great people. Uh, we still have some more time to go with this. Uh, so let me see. Um, let's go back to one thing that we uh, we touched on a little bit and probably I did a little bit more talking about it than you did. Uh, a person that feels they have a job they know that they have a job and whether or not they have recognized it uh, take it from both points uh, we have about yeah, six minutes to go about five minutes to go so in about five minutes time tell us what you think about how a person should come to that realization and how they should probably take it from there once they come to that realization to make that transition to job versus I'm doing something I really enjoy and mm -hmm. uh, I have the income that I'm wanting uh, at least it will satisfy my purposes, my needs uh, and I'm moving on with my life now very happily Right, I think that it goes, I think that you mentioned fear and that's a huge thing, I think people cannot base their activity their whole life on fear I remember um, I was a single mom for 17 years, and I had to uh, be the social support, basically, for my... I, I, I feel very blessed that I was gifted with a, a, a divine son, and I would never change that for anything. But I kind of moved away from my purpose, and I fell into the trap of living in fear because I needed an income to support us. So I know that I myself self was living a life of not my purpose. I was unhappy with my job. I was one that would drive to work and think, oh, I've got to go that thing down. Even though to, to many people my, my life looked grand, it wasn't my purpose. And I wasn't feeling satisfied with it. And I think that that's what people need to look at is don't let yourself fall in the fear of I have to keep this job because I need the money. I'm not saying I want everybody today to go get their notice at their jobs. <laughs> there needs to be there needs to be a transformation into your purpose, and you need to first identify what your purpose is. And you know, I've got my website. You can email me if you need some prodding into helping that. But we've got to um, have people know that there there are ways you can't you can't work in a job that you hate all of your life, save up your retirement until you're at an age that you've got a couple of years to do what you wanted to do all of your life until you become too um, unflexible or unable to do the things that you wanted to do. You know, I used to look at people like that. They, they work all their life. They save up their money to retire, to do the things that they really want to do. And then they have a, just a short period of time to do all the things in their life that they wanted to do. And I think that that's a really sad thing, and I and that's something that needs to be adjusted. And I know when people start working in their purpose path that that will be adjusted because you'll have joy throughout your life. You'll not feel like you need to go on retirement to all of a sudden enjoy your life. 
to be enjoying your life every step of the way. Yeah, that was something I was thinking of just recently, about thinking about some of my uncles and whatnot that they're now past, but they did what they had to do, what they felt they had to do, and when they finally retired, they moved out into the country, and they only lived there for maybe maximum of 10 years, and then, well, they're gone, and... Uh, it, they didn't get to enjoy the life that they really wanted to have for so long. But even as people used to ask me, says, what do you want to do when you retire? I said, I probably will not retire. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I'll probably die teaching because I enjoy teaching. <laughs> probably right there on the floor, teaching somebody. Blah. Apparently an embarrassing thing for the kids, but oh well, <laughs> that's just life and death. <laughs> <laughs> they chose to teach you there because that's part of the Yeah. <laughs> He fun. was teaching us how to do this, and <laughs> <laughs> he just fell. <laughs> but, yeah, it's just, I'm doing that, and it's, for me, uh, money has never really been one of those goals, which is yeah, probably why I live the life that I do, but nonetheless, I've always had what I needed, and... Um, you know, there's another part of the show we need to get into for another time, but let's get there for another time. But in the meantime, right now, do you have a website where people can contact you? I do. It's www.marilynmarilynlawrence.com. And I've got a contact page on there with uh, go straight to my email. Okay, so that's MarilynLouiseLawrence dot com. That's it. All righty, and it's a one site kind of gets you to everything you need to know about Marilyn Louise Lawrence, right? Exactly, and I also have a blog site, if, and you can sign it up to get my blog, and that's just MarilynLawrence dot com. Okay, cool. And uh, in our final minute or less. Do you have any final words for us? I think I have probably two million final words, Kurt, but I'll try to <laughs> <laughs> just a few. I want to thank you so much for having me on the show, and I do look forward to our uh, conversation with my husband, Dale, and myself. That will be a completely different conversation, but also very enjoyable. I want to leave the audience with a couple of thoughts, and I'm hoping that what they've heard today will register with them that you don't have to stay in a job that you don't like if it's not satisfying you because the reason it's not satisfying you is because you're not living in your purpose and you can make that change. I don't want you to quit your job today, but we can. I can help you make a transition into your next purpose-filled life. So I want everyone to have hope of that. I want everyone to know that they can live in their joy. Wonderful. Thank you, Marilyn, for being a part of the show. We will definitely see you soon with Dale, and we'll see you again in the future for another show. In the meantime, thank you, everyone, for being here, and we hope that you learned something and <coughs> will help you in your life. Uh, Marilyn, thanks again. My pleasure. Thank you. And we'll see everybody again soon. Be well. Thank you for joining us on Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. Be sure to follow our schedule, events, blog, and more at ytyrradio.tk or ytyrradio.wordpress.com. We hope you enjoyed our first hour. We'll be right back after this short break. Stay informed about the latest Freedom Talk Radio Network news at freedomtalkradio.co.uk. That's freedomtalkradio.co.uk. You're listening to the Freedom Talk Radio Network on Blog Talk Radio. <coughs> Welcome to Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio with your host, Kay Williams Spencer, and friends. 
This program is here to help all of us understand our journey in and through life by means of straightforward conversations, discussions, guest interviews, and listener emails. For more information, visit our site at ytyrradio.tk. Now, here's your host. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second half of the show. We are now live, and if you'd like to call in, our number is 347-677-0812. That's good for the United States and Canada. The number, again, is 347-677-0812. If you're calling from outside of the U.S. or Canada, just add 001 to the number. And uh, I hope this is Mona that's on our line. This is my dear friend and co-host, Mona Wellington. You there? I am here. Hi, Hi everybody. <laughs> Good to have you here. Um, let's Hello. see. Um, I was just listening to the show, and I actually bored myself to death talking too much. So, <laughs> Mona, what do you have to say about the show? I think the show was excellent, and there are a couple of things I would love to talk to you about. Well, let's do it. Um, based on what you told them. Okay, first of all, can you explain to me a little bit more the concept of channeling the angels? What does that entail? Well, I can't speak for Marilyn, but I'll speak for myself. In the channeling side of things, it is just learning to quiet your mind and listen. Uh, We've had that conversation probably before, but uh, for those who are listening, uh, the idea of the channeling, uh, same thing as being a psychic, same thing as doing other things, is learning to quiet your mind. Stop thinking, because the mind always wants to think about what I have to do, what I should have done, what I didn't do, uh, what I want to do in the future. It's always, it wants to be active. It wants to be active. Even when you're sleeping, it wants to be active. You get dreams. Okay. The idea here is just to quiet the mind and go to a state of what's called nothingness or no-thingness, which is nothing is entering your mind, no thoughts, no thoughts past, present, future, and uh, no concerns, no worries, just silence. It's very difficult. It sounds uh, easy for most people, and people usually say, I can't, I can't, I can't. Well, you didn't just get born and stand up and walk straight out of the womb, so there is that time that you have to learn. You have to keep practicing. You get up, you fall down. You get up, fall down. And the more you practice at it, the less you fall down, the more you're able to stand up, and then pretty soon you're able to walk and then run and so on and so forth. But it's not an immediate thing. So you have to practice at it. And once you get to that point in your life where you can quiet your mind and you listen to it, because even if you come from a Christian background, you already know that the saying is... um, I'm sorry, I was just thinking of something else. Uh, (laughs) The saying is is that uh, God speaks to you in a still, small voice. In other words, he's not yelling at you, Hey, what's up? No, he just kind of talks to you very calmly very it's not just so much of as we were talking about it even on last week's show it's not one of those it's just like it's uh, that leaves you always awestruck you find that uh, God or creator has a great sense of humor so on and so forth but he still doesn't yell it he's there he'll laugh and talk with you he'll give you the information you can have conversations and go from there Okay, so, so I guess cause I know you and I talked about this uh, quite a bit over the last couple. Live a very busy lifestyle, and it is very difficult for me to quiet my mind because once I'm actually still, I'm always the one to pull out a journal and a pen, and I'm writing down honeydew lists for myself, things that I know that I need to do for the rest of the week. So for me, what I've been doing is. Um, I sit still, I might play one of my favorite songs, nothing with a bunch of bass or, you know, booty pop music, (laughs) but like maybe some classical music or something like that that has a soft uh, melody, melody, and I just try to concentrate on my breathing. 
And by me taking my focus off of what I need to do, the task that I need to complete, and just focus on either the, the tone of the music or my breathing, that's how I'm able to actually be still. Yeah. I, so do you think that's effective? No, actually, what you're just talking about, the breathing part, uh, when you see pictures of people sitting in that half lotus or lotus position, and they have their elbows tucked in at uh, their hips and, uh, well, where the thigh and the torso meet. And their hands are palms up and they have usually the index finger or the center finger touching the thumb. Actually, as I was taught, the idea of that and the basis of that was when you're going into a meditative, meditative state... Many people use that breathing method to actually to transfer the thoughts away from it, just as you were saying, transferring the thoughts away from thoughts. In other words, what do I have to do? What do I need to do? What am I going to do? Then, yeah, 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 all these thousands of things that are going through your head, like the Micro Machine Man, if you remember those commercials. Um, and you're actually supposed to count up to, I believe it's 22 or 23, I forget which one it is, starting with is, I remember it, which is something I don't do, which is why I'm not <laughs> really into it, because I don't need to go that way. But you start with, I believe it is, the little finger, and you take a deep breath in, and it's very, very slow. You take in, now the average person breathes about, I believe is 20 some times a minute, I forget exactly how many is now. And you're slowing it down to where it's almost like five breath cycles per minute. And you're inhaling very slowly in through the nostrils and out through the mouth. This is the way I was taught. Other people say it differently. But as we always say, at least in this area of uh, metaphysics anyway, it's not so much of who is telling you correctly is just there's many roads that lead to the same ocean okay so this is how we do it this is how i was taught to do it there's other people that will tell you that is differently so actually you're looking for the end result so how you get there that's your choice i mean there's people that uh they will go through all sorts of imagining that you're going here and going there they use the imagination and this one we're just talking about concentrating on your breathing breathe in breathe out and you do it very very slowly and your concentration is on that and by time you're finished with this up to 22 23 times <coughs> which sounds very short but trust me it's not a short exercise by that time you are definitely if you concentrate on the breathing you're definitely there and now you have that opportunity to listen and to hear all that, uh, well, all that you're asking for and probably even more. I mean, I thought initially when you and I used to talk about that, I would say, you know, he must really think I have time to sit up here and sit on the couch and take deep breaths and be still when I have a million things to do. But I was also dealing with issues of insomnia and my stress level was really high. So I've come to realize over the last couple of days that the more I just take time, some me time, where I just be still and breathe and just think of nothing, I'm able to sleep better at night. I've noticed a change in my blood pressure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've just noticed that there have been a lot of changes in general, even as far as my energy level, my level of creativity, my ability to be positive has been affected by that. So I definitely, it's something that I definitely recommend to people. I'm not saying uh, don't go to a doctor if you have high blood pressure or any other type of illness like that. But what I am saying is I think that this is, it's good to just take these, you know, even if it's five minutes, three minutes, however long you can do it, start out slow, but eventually it's going to have a long-term impact on your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it definitely has. So, it, yeah. yeah, it definitely has a benefit to the life. Uh, to give you on the physical side, when you're learning how to deep breathe, and the deep breathing exercises, I, we didn't cover that so much uh, when we were talking about it before. But 
the deep breathing exercises is not the military style where you're breathing in and you're expanding your chest. No, you have a diaphragm in your uh, in your body. It's just below the lungs and just above your endocrine glands, which is your stomach, your spleen, your liver, and all the rest of those organs. And the idea is is that the the rib cage does move. Yes, it has to move because if it was just brittle, as soon as somebody hits you and it, you break a rib. Now that's not a good thing. But when you're breathing, you breathing. You're supposed to breathe down. Let the lungs expand downward. And as you're doing this, this massages just this deep breathing, this slow massage of your endocrine glands. It'll massage your liver and your spleen and your bile duct and your stomach and your intestines eventually and all the rest of those organs that are below it and this is that slow methodical massage that actually benefits your body in the long run just because they are getting something that they need right and see, that's exactly why you're a leader, because you almost guided me through a little meditation right there. Just, <laughs> just by explaining. See, that's why you're a leader, right? Ah, uh, yeah, okay. I'm, yeah, I've, I'm, I've accepted that, but I'm still having that little playing. Like, yeah, okay, really. <laughs> well, just like she said, you have to learn how to embrace it, because ultimately, that's your purpose in life. So until you're actually able to embrace it, you're not going to actually be able to walk into your purpose and your destiny. And we don't want that. We want to be able to fulfill our purpose, Uh whatever it may be. Yeah. Because I mean, I think at the end of the day, we're not leaders in everything in every area of our life. There are aspects. I have leadership traits as well, but we're not leaders in every area of our lives. It's just certain aspects, be it, you know, the leader of your household or maybe at at your job there's a task focus group and your boss has assigned you to be a leader of this group or who knows. But, I mean, it's not like you're playing that role throughout every aspect of your life. But the areas that you are in that role, you have to embrace it. Yeah, that's true. Um, Yeah, it's one of those things that we need to learn to understand because for those of us who do understand this and for those who probably are going, "Ah, I'm not too sure about that or they're in denial, uh, there has been many, many cases, including, what's his name, Uh, General George C. Patton from World War II, who when he was in uh, the assault on Germany from, well, as we normally say from Germany, and he was pressing eastward, He was in France, and he came across a town that he stopped, and he looked at it, and he says, you know, if you go over here and you go over there, and he's never been to this town in his present lifetime or in that present lifetime, but he identified places in this old town that he had never seen before uh, in that lifetime, but he could identify it. There's a child that was born, uh, I shouldn't say born, but um, I don't know how old he would be about right now. I would assume he would be close to 18. And it was in a magazine article. I'm not talking about one of the crazy ones. I'm talking about a major magazine where he was identifying things from uh, a pilot uh, from World War II. And he identified things that a kid at that time, he was about 10 years old, he was telling things that no 10-year-old should know about flight, especially in a plane from that era. So, in essence, what we're just saying is, and this is... Uh, this is something that mostly, I would say, Christianity tends to deny because Judaism, and I think there's quite a few other religions, will actually tell you that there is that reincarnation of the spirit or soul. And uh, sometimes you do have memories from previous lifetimes. And it's also been told that um, in each lifetime that you come into, there is something that you have to experience. So. Even as I was taught from this in Judaism, 
Uh, it's if you give birth to a child and it only lives, say, for a few hours, few minutes, or just a few day, few days, and it suffers from it has uh, well, it goes through the process of crib death. That was something that it had to do, to, uh, to to learn to understand uh, for its life as it continues on. Everybody's got experiences that they're supposed to have. And you will have those experiences. Now, in such things as with me having my difficulty with in understanding and accepting leadership roles, well, okay, that's my choice. But uh, as far as having the difficulty, I could just totally embrace it and move on, which I'm getting to, but I haven't gotten there just yet, but it's like 90% there. So... <coughs> These are things that we have, there are things that you have choices in, and there are things that you are here to do, to learn, and to experience. And I think that whole choices component goes in really nicely with what you guys were talking about as far as people working until they're 65 years old, and then when they retire, they don't, they're not really fully able to enjoy their retirement because they, you know, they don't have like 20, 30 years to just travel or do whatever they want to do during their retirement because unfortunately they may, you know, pass mm-hmm. or yeah. die. Um, and I think, you know, it's so important, like for myself, and I'm talking to myself as well, um, I have like a thousand, I've always been that, but I've always kept in mind that the job are a means to an end. So I use the jobs as a stepping stone so that I can have what I want to have, not just financially, but just in every aspect of my life. And I've set a goal that by this age, I need to have this much money saved so that I can do what I want to do. But also in the meantime, the reason why I have so many jobs is because the thing, I truly believe the thing that you are most passionate about is the thing you should be doing. Mm -hmm. So for me, I love to talk. (laughs) (laughs) I love to talk. Like, I feel like I should be a talk show host. I need to be, you know, I just love to talk and interact with people. So that's why I wrote my book so that I can use that as a catalyst so that I can do more motivational speaking. And, you know, I want to be in that area because that's the thing that drives me to get up in the morning to go to the other jobs that I may not be over the moon about, but I know I have to do it. So I think it's important for people to set goals, figure out what makes you happy, and figure out how to turn that thing that makes you happy into an income. Like, I think it's very doable. <laughs> Wait a minute. There's two things that I no. Yeah. There's two things I want to bring up first. Okay. First, in the first hour, we were I ran a commercial for uh, "Happily Never After" by Mona. For those of you who hadn't put the two and two together, this is Mona from "Happily Never After." Uh, so, uh, just to give a verbal commercial here, you want to learn more about her book? It's "Happily Never After." Dot info. And, um, Mona, why don't you tell us in your own words a little bit, I know we did this on a previous show, but it's only on YouTube, tell us a little bit about your book, then I'm going to ask you another question. Okay, my book is about, um, real quick, a few days before my wedding, my ex-fiance called me over the phone and told me that he could, we couldn't get married. So the book is about how my unresolved childhood issues affected me and my decision to stay in a relationship that I know that I shouldn't have been in. And then after the relationship was off, I still continue to try to deal with those issues because it was affecting my health as far as I ballooned up to 400 and something pounds. I was having issues with trust, just having all kinds of issues just because I had not addressed the emotional issues from my past. So the book is just talking about my story, and it gives tons of tips and strategies in the back on what I did in order to achieve my happily ever after ending by myself, (laughs) not by buying a Benz or Jack or or getting married or having kids, which I'm, I'm not saying any of that is bad, but my happiness now comes from within. So that's what it's about. Okay. What's your question? What's your well, second question? Well, thank you question? very much. <laughs> <laughs> You're 
<laughs> well, folks, you know where to find it, and her website does tell you about where you can actually buy these books. Uh, it's not just on Amazon. There's bookstores and every place else. So it's a one-stop place to find out all about Mona and her book. Uh, if you want to follow Mona and her blogs, she does bl- uh, weekly blogs on uh, ytyrradio.tk or .wordpress.com. Uh, so just go to blogs. Her blog is up there today, and uh, you can find out more about her from there. Anyway, second question. Back to what you were talking about with goals and possessions and whatnot, and then tying that in with purpose. Now, I have my own way of looking at it, but I want to hear your point of view because, as you know, in the show, it's not about what I see. It's how other people see life and how they react to it. So there is no right or wrong to this. So the question here is, now, for me, uh, goals and possessions and monetary gain, uh, my goals are different. I like to, I have always enjoyed living life. If I want to get up and I want to go someplace, I get up and I go. If I want to stay, I stay. And if I want to participate in a community, I find a place for that I can actually participate in that community, etc., etc. But in my tr- in my lifetime, I've learned that for me, and this is the difference, and this is where I want you to expand upon it on your own in your own words, is that for me, possessions were something that actually tied me down. In other words, I cannot even. I know you come from a Christian background, so let's put it this way. <clears throat> Even in the New Testament, it talks about lay not for yourself uh, earthly possessions. In other words, things that can be stolen, taken, destroyed, etc., etc. Um, that, it's not saying that you shouldn't have them, but I believe the text is talking about, at least from my own point of view, because this is the way I live my life, is... Don't put so much possession. Don't put so much value in your earthly possessions that you miss out on your ultimate goal, which I'm, is not so much of uh, heaven as being a place, but heaven as being your euphoria. Because if somebody steals something from you, a few times in my life people have stolen from me, and it just felt like I was. Um, I was violated because someone took something that I had and so on and so forth. And it's just like, that's not a feeling that I enjoyed having. So it's like, I have what I need and enjoy. And I'm not a collector of things. So if, let's say, in in the age that we live in, uh, with all the conspiracy theories and some of them may be conspiracy facts... Uh, if something does happen because uh, we're finding more of an increase in uh, global climate changes and there's been an increase in volcano- volcanoes and with uh, earthquakes and even with meteors uh, coming through our atmosphere, we're hearing more of these things than we've ever heard in the last, even in your lifetime. Uh, if you get my idea, it's just like, how much can you actually, in these days, put towards things instead of a value that cannot be taken away from you? Um, say this. <clears throat> I, when I was growing up, you know, I was, I was, I've been, in, I was raised <laughs> Catholic, and then my mom decided that we were going to do uh, Baptist. Then I became non-denominational and. You know, I've bounced around, but my 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 foundation is still that I believe in God, um, and I am not necessarily a collector of things. But what I what I have been taught over the years, in which case, now that I'm an adult, I don't believe in that. Like people will say, "Oh, well, if you are Christian and you believe in God, then you're going to be poor, and you need to accept that." I do not accept that because. I do not want to be poor. I don't live. I don't like living check to check. I just don't like the whole saying. I don't know if people have heard it. You got to rob Peter to pay Paul in order to pay your rent or your mortgage. I don't live by that philosophy. And that's exactly why I work so many jobs. I'm working a bunch of jobs now because I'm working for my future. I want to be debt free. I do not want to be um, in my 50s or 60s having to pay 
this person, this person, and this person. Because it's the weirdest thing. Like I was talking to a friend the other day, and I live in a house. And so we were talking about how even though you live in a house and you say you own a house, you really never really own that house because even though you pay the mortgage off, you still got to pay taxes on that house. You still got to pay the homeowners association on that house. So how do you actually say you own the house if you're still having to pay on a yearly basis to remain in the house? So I had an aha moment like, oh, oh. it's like, are you, you're right. Uh-huh. But I do not put a lot of my energy into, I got to have a jack, I got to have this, I got to have that, just because I live in Texas and we were hit by Hurricane Ike a couple of years ago. And I remember the hurricane just ripping the roof off of my house and me being outside screaming like someone had just taken my life away because my house was destroyed. And it was because of that incident that I came to realize, okay, you know what? It's just a house. I'm fortunate to have a house, but guess what? I will be blessed or fortunate again to have somewhere else to place my head. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew my house was going to be rebuilt because I had insurance and other things. I knew I was going to be over. For me, I just, hey, I want to have a savings account. I want if, you know, while I'm on vacation, if I want to go to Greece, I can go to Greece. Um, I need, for me, in my mental state, I got to have roots. I can't, you know, there are people that can do this, but me personally, I can't just sell everything put a bunch of clothes on the back and across the country. That's not me. Mm-hmm. Um, just cause that's not how I function. I need to have roots. Um, but for people that can do that, I say, go do it. You know, it's all about living your life to the fullest. If you're okay with that. Yay. I wish I could, but for me, I need roots. And for me, that is, I need an address. I need some place where my mail goes. You know, I need people to know this is where I am. But like I said, if something should happen and I have to move in an apartment or whatever, I will. I am just in a place in my life right now that I know the concept of reaping and sowing. And a lot of people think I'm weird about this, but I know all the good things that I sow on a daily basis. I'm one of those people where literally I will... Because I don't care that much about possessions, like I don't have to have the biggest house, the biggest, I don't have to have all of that. I don't have a problem giving you the shirt off my back. I don't have a problem opening the door to a friend that may have been evicted from their apartment. I don't have a problem with that. I believe in sharing. And because I live my life with that philosophy of helping others, I know if I should ever be in need, it will be extended back to me. So I don't know if that answers the question or not. But that's just my philosophy. I live on the principles of reaping and sowing. Mm-hmm. Do good, it's going to come back to you. Do bad, have a crappy attitude, it's going to come back to oh, you. Oh, yeah, big time. And that's not just a Christian belief system either. Uh, it's, for many people, clear across the board, clear across most religions, I would say, from most of what I know. I think there's one or two religions that don't quite get that, but okay. That's neither here nor there at the moment. Right now, we're going to take a couple of minutes away from the show just to do a commercial break. So those of you who are with us, stay with us, and we'll be right back. And uh, in the last part of the show, uh, for any listeners that are out there, because I know from the first show we played, this like the show was going to end. Uh, if there's anyone still out there, you want to get in on the conversation, ask questions, make comments, please do give us a call um, in about 15 minutes at... Three four seven six seven seven zero eight one two, and if you're calling from out of the country, uh, just add zero zero one to that. And if by chance you see it on there, because I don't have the screen that the listeners listen to, if you see a Skype button on there, you can call in by Skype too. So please hold on. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Kay William Spencer, the host of Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. I've just dropped by to tell you about the new format starting in August 2013. 
In August, the show's format is changing to a more spiritually based program. I have four co-hosts that, with me, will present discussions and conversations from many different perspectives. We're also opening to the public, in a limited manner, the ability to ask questions via email. Join me and my co-host, Pat Kammer, Troy Matheson, Amanda Stedman, and Mona Wellington, and our guest for what I'm sure will be an enlightening and intriguing hour of spiritual and personal growth. For more information, visit us at ytyrradio.wordpress.com or ytyrradio.tk. Ladies, have you or someone you know been stood up on your wedding day or just before that special day? How did you feel that day or afterward? Here is one heartbreaking book about one woman's bright and wonderful day and future turned dark and ugly and how she got through it. Happily Never After by Mona is for those who have the experience of heartbreak at the altar or just before being left with a bouquet, tears, and embarrassment. Happily Never After by Mona, even for men to know the long-term pain you may cause and may experience later in life. Where to buy Happily Ever After can be found at happilyneverafter.info. That's happilyneverafter.info. Hi, this is Kay William Spencer of Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. Join us every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern on Freedom Talk Radio for enlightening, humorous, and intriguing conversations that I have with my co-hosts and or our guest, all to help you look at life and your choices differently. For more information, go to ytyrradio.tk or if you prefer ytyrradio.wordpress.com. Join us. The Perinoid 01 and Friends in the Mantra Cave on blogtalkradio.com forward slash Chakra Khan. Get a one-of-a-kind comedic reading or mantra from Mr. Perry. Have your snacks ready early and set your alarm for Friday night at 11 p.m. Central and prepare yourself for 30 minutes of fun. Call in early and beat the rush at 347-637-1932. All readings for entertainment only. Hi, and welcome back. Uh, we seem to have lost the co-host Mona on there, but we've got another caller, unless that's her calling on a different line. So let's give it a, call, a try and see who it is. Hello, caller. Hello, it's you. Oh, it is you. I'm Hello. back. Hello. <laughs> Good to have you back. <laughs> I had a major power outage. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Well, good to know that you're yeah. back. Sounds like you're living in Mexico. That's what happens here. <laughs> it just disappears. <laughs> but... <laughs> okay. Listen, we were talking about, before the commercial breaks, <clears throat> about uh, life purposes and whatnot. So let me ask you in a different way. Okay, you've told me how you... Uh, you're not quite the same as I am. I can pick up and leave and move and just throw in a backpack or whatever, and I'm gone someplace else. It's not your style. That's fine. It's not for everybody, but that makes us individuals. But we're individuals that are all connected. So once we understand the connection that we have with everyone, because let's put it this way. Um, I, I, let me ask you a question before I go into that, uh, because it just popped into my mind. Uh you have a religious as well as a spiritual background, which is the reason why you're on the show in the first place. Is because you have a way of looking at life that's differently from that of just dogma. <clears throat> now, pretty much most people have been taught that, yes, we've been created by a creator, and now we are separate from that creator. Uh, how do you see that, or do I need to elaborate more on that? I, you can elaborate more for the listeners, but I don't. I I completely understand that question. I'm not separate. That is my father. Uh-huh. <laughs> so that's just like asking, "Am I separate?" 
from my earthly mother and father, and no, I'm not. Every time I look in the mirror, I see hints and glimpses of my mother, and I see traits of my father. It's the same concept. When I look in the mirror, I see what my mother has created, what my heavenly father has created. Um, so, no, I don't feel like I'm separate. If anything, this is how I look at it. God is the tree or the creator, or I know everybody has their different names, but for me, it's God. God is the tree, we're the branches, and the leaves. Hmm. And that's how I see it. So I will never be disconnected from him, nor do I ever want to be. Well, uh, just to kind of go with the last little statement that you said is, don't ever want to be. Uh, it's one of those things of... We can't. It's not like a wall plug that we can just pull something out of the wall. And we're no longer connected. Uh, no. Uh, besides in that fact, it's just that if you think about it on a literal basis, my opinion, you, you can, I encourage you to elaborate on this, even if you disagree. It doesn't matter. Uh, once you pull something out of the wall, it just means you don't have a direct current coming in to the plug itself. Is it actually disconnected from energy? No, it's not disconnected from energy. It's no. just disconnected from a higher source of energy, or as George Carlin puts it, uh, the electricity flowing through your walls is nothing more than controlled lightning. So, <laughs> so we just unplugged it from the controlled right. lightning, that's all. Um, right. So... It's one of those things of no matter whether you accept it or you deny it, we are all interconnected. And I won't get into the long uh, <laughs> the long explanation that I gave last week, but anyhow. Um, yeah. Well, let me stop right there. Do you have anything that you want to say continuing from there or another subject? <clears throat> I, I truly believe that we're all... Even if we may not want to admit it, yeah. <laughs> Especially when you know, when you start thinking about people that you may not have time feeling for, you dislike them, you despise them. Which you know it is what it is. I know everyone is like you know. I know the Bible talks about a uh, God faith, which is unconditional love, which means embracing someone and loving them in spite of, and that's difficult. I think for a lot of people to achieve because you start thinking about rapists and killers and, you know, murderers and all these different people. You're like, how can I love this person when this person went out and committed this crime? Um, but at the end of the day, I do believe that we're all connected. We are all connected. And I'm not going to sit here and try to act like I'm this two, goody two-shoes that, you know, I'm going to say wholeheartedly, yay, you know, that's my brother sitting in prison for murder because um, we are connected. But I do believe that we are. I think it's just difficult for us as human beings to completely, in all instances, have unconditional love for someone. I think it's easier when it's a spouse or it's a relative or, you know, your children. But I think sometimes it's a little bit more difficult for people that we consider to be, you know, fallible. They've sinned. It's out in the open or whatever. So... And I think that would be an interesting topic for us to discuss at a later time. But um, that's what I believe. But I do want to touch base quickly because I know we're running out of time. Is um, we're doing good for you right guys now. were talking earlier. We have time. Yeah, we got about twenty-two minutes. Go for it. <laughs> okay. I the thing that is just really, really on my heart that I wanted to talk to you about was I know you guys were talking about. Superman and Invisible Man, different TV personalities and video games and how um, it affects children and simple play and all of that. And the whole idea of people, you know, it starts off, of course, as, as being babies and developing the children and then adolescents and, you know, and then young adults and then adults and how, you know, there are a lot of adults out there that are living, living a life of a lie be it they're having been able to come out with their sexuality or they're, they're living with someone that they don't really love or they're in a career that they're unhappy about or they're just not truthful about their feelings on whatever level that is. 
And I just think it's so important that you start out, just like she said, you start out as a, at, with, a, with a baby in the womb. It's the perfect time to start talking to that baby in there. Talk to you. I call them, I call them belly babies. Don't laugh at me. But <laughs> you talk to your belly baby, and then when that baby, you push that baby out or you hold that baby in your hand for the first time, you have to start instilling these values into them, these beliefs. You have to tell them, you know, you're loved, you're lovable, you're worthy, you're going to go grow up and set this world on fire. Not literally, but you're going to go out there and make a difference. You're going to be successful, whatever success is for you. You're going to be happy. And then eventually that person will grow up and they'll be an individual that can stand on their own two feet and not be you know, will be able to make their own decisions, not necessarily caring about what society says. Like, I know you and I were talking about this the other day, about how society is constantly changing about what is acceptable and what's unacceptable, what's beautiful and what's not beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just sort of to be able to take a stand and say, hey, here I am, love it or hate it, this is me. And I think it starts from the womb. It starts from the womb. You can't let the TV be your child's first parent when you're the parent. Oh, yeah. Don't let your TV, you know, raise your children. Don't let games, iPhones, with computers, you have to be the parent. You have to make time to spend your child and, and guide them in the direction in which they need to go. Yeah, as a matter of fact, something you just got through talking about is I remember when uh, in my first marriage where my children came from, uh, my wife and I were both working at the time. I was an accountant and she was working in medical records uh, for a large hospital in a suburban Chicago area. And we were making fairly good money. I mean, we had a house, we had a couple of cars, I had a motorcycle, and we had two children eventually. And because we were working, and both of us worked daytime, uh, we had to find a babysitter for once they got old enough uh, that she could return to work. And um, <clears throat> so when she returned to work, we found a babysitter for the daytime. And by the time we had this babysitter for probably two months, maybe three, we actually sat down and worked out our budget and said, you know, for what we're paying this woman, <laughs> it, was almost, it was almost the equivalent of one of our paychecks. It's like 90% of our wow. paycheck just to have our two children sat by somebody else during the day. The other side of this was the fact that what we thought was, now even though this woman was very nice, we loved her to death, she was a very nice woman, the point that we thought about was not only are we paying her to take care of the ch to children, these children, our children, are learning her values. Now, granted, they're, they're, that's fine to a certain degree because that was one of the reasons why we chose her as a babysitter. She's an adult. And um, that's fine, but do you really want your children? Do you want, and we asked ourselves, do we want our children coming up with her values or with our values? Because there's things that makes us different from that person. So if they're learning somebody else's values, they come home and they're just going, well, that isn't the way so-and-so told me, and that isn't the way they do their life, and you well, you put yourself in that situation by letting your kids learn somebody else's value without giving them your own core values. Right. That, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a thought. Now, let me get you back on a, something that you were talking about a little while ago, and unconditional love. Um. Can you sum that up shortly? And I'm going to give you a little time to think about it um, before I let you back on the mic here. Uh, it, can you summarize what unconditional love is for you? Now, the way I look at it is unconditional love is loving someone regardless of what they're doing to you. If they're 
let's not get into the real dramatic side. If they've stolen something from you or if they just slapped you maliciously or they're yelling and screaming at you, can you just look at them and say, I'm not going to take this personally. Maybe you're going through something and I can give you some leeway and just go, okay, fine. That doesn't mean that I am saying that I love you unconditionally and I'm going to sit up here and let you steal from me. I'm going to let you beat me up or anything. But it's because I love and respect myself more, or if not just as equally, but I'm going to love myself more. So I'm going to protect myself, and if I can, I'm going to walk away from this situation. And I really choose not to return to the situation because you are not respecting me. And this point of respect versus unconditional love. And that doesn't mean that just because you're yelling, screaming, and hollering, and beating me up, and stealing my stuff, that means that I have to take it personally and say, I hate you. I hate what you do, but I don't hate you. So I think I've let you uh, think long enough on that one. I hope so. Anyway, so tell me, what do you think? What is your opinion? I think... That unconditional love is just as you said. It's being able to love someone in spite of their shortcomings. Mm -hmm. But I will say this. I truly believe unconditional love is something that we have to work on. Because there are some things that you might not like about other people. So it's something you literally have to work on. Um I'm not going to call anybody out, but there are a couple of people in my life right now that I love, but I do not like mm -hmm. them. Yeah. <laughs> and that might sound harsh. I love them, which means I care if they live or they die. If they need something, they can call me. And <coughs> if I have it, I will give it to them. But do I want to go to Sunday brunch with them? And not so no. much. Do I want them just coming and hanging out in my house? Uh, I don't no. think so. So I think it's something that you have to truly, but I think also in order for you to truly be able to love another person unconditionally, you mm. love unconditionally, and a lot of us fall short with that, and that's why we can't do it in the first place. Like, can you genuinely say without a shadow of a doubt that you love yourself unconditionally? Mm. And I'm talking about in spite of that five-pound belly that you've been trying to get up, rid of for the last 20 years, in spite of maybe the ball spot that you've developed on your head and you have to wear wigs and weaves and everything else, in spite of the fact that you might wear a size 12 shoe when all your friends wear eight and you wish you did, or whatever the case may be, in spite of that, you love yourself and you have fully come to terms with it and you embrace everything about yourself even if those are things that you want to change you still have embraced them for what they are right now and you're working on it we're all working on stuff but just have you love it while you're working on it i'm sorry go ahead that was it oh, okay. <laughs> i just have to learn how to love yourself unconditionally before you can wholeheartedly say, I love someone else unconditionally. Yeah, you, you have a very good point there. Um, I had a English student here a few months ago, and we were talking about unconditional love and loving yourself and taking care of yourself first because there's so many people in life that always put everybody and everything else in front of themselves. And they consider it to be the self-sacrificing life. <clears throat> and I asked her a question just to be, I said, this is just an example, but I'm not asking you for money. And I said, all right, let me ask you for an example. Can you loan me 5,000 pesos? It's a little bit less than $500, $500 US. Can you loan me 5,000 pesos today and I'll pay it back to you next week? And if you want, I'll even pay you a little bit extra just for the loan. I know it's quick and whatnot, so yeah, you can have some extra money. But I will have it back on next week, Saturday. So can you loan me 5,000? thousand pesos today and she looked at me she goes i don't have five thousand pesos to loan i said exactly my point okay. if you don't have it how can you give it how can you loan it how can you help someone else with something you don't have 
So if you don't take care of you first, it doesn't mean you're taking care of yourself selfishly. But if you don't eat, how can you go out here and go over to your neighbor's house and help them move in or out? It doesn't matter. How can you go out if you haven't had enough sleep, if somebody needs you to go up and do a speaking engagement? Your mind is foggy. You're, you haven't eaten in 24 hours. If you haven't eaten, if you haven't slept, is your mind going to be fresh to get up and go talk at an engagement the next day? No. You can go on with all these examples, but the point is you have to take care of yourself first, even if it's just minimally, so you can be of use to someone else. And then she thought about it, right? and she went, that makes sense. And now she's actually learned to take care of herself, but still be of service to friends, family, and others that even she doesn't know. I mean, I can really relate to that because a lot of people over, over the years have told me they, they say it's the martyr complex where you're willing to just throw everything, up, you know, you're just willing to give your 100% to someone else instead of taking time to just focus on yourself. It's always wanting to save someone else. But it's okay, I don't know if you can hear me. Okay. You know, does that mean they're not going to be my friend anymore? You know, or I just was so afraid of what would happen if I said no or when I set healthy boundaries. Oh, yeah. But I think as I'm older and I've become more aware of that mm -hmm. and that desire to want to save everyone so that they don't have to miss out on a meal or, you know, just that desire to want to save someone and help them so they don't experience some of the same difficulties I've experienced come to realize sometimes you have to allow people to go through their own trial. If you don't allow people to go through their own trials in life, it's kind of like you're doing them a disservice. Yep. Because those trials and tribulations are the things that eventually build their... Do that so much now because it's not my responsibility to do that. My responsibility right now is to take care of Mona and put me first, even though it is so difficult. I will not sit here and make it seem like it's such an easy task to put yourself first because it's hard because you feel selfish sometimes when you do it, but you have to. You have yeah. to. You most definitely have to. Uh, there is something that you, well, never mind. I, I don't think you're going to remember it, but there was a point where you were dropping off the air. Um, but it was just talking about uh, how you found in, in your own lifetime where you had to start taking care of yourself, putting yourself first, but not in a selfish manner, if you will. Can you, do you know where I was right. on that one? No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I understand. <laughs> well, we only... I just know that right now... It's important to take care of myself, and I strongly encourage everybody else to do that as well. I'm not saying, you know, don't take care of your kids, like let them starve or whatever, but we are saying that just like when you're on an airplane, I didn't understand this concept until a couple of years ago when you're on a plane and they tell you if the plane is going to crash, put the mask on your face first, put the oxygen mask on you first, and then put it on your child or the, 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 the disabled person or the elderly person that's with you. I get that now. Like, in order for you to help anyone else, you got to be taken care yeah. of. Yeah, you put the, put the mask on somebody else first, and then you die. Um, the same thing we learned in Life Saving was you're going out to help someone, and you get there, and they want to fight. They We teach you how, well, excuse me, they taught us, which I ended up teaching others, uh, how to actually, if somebody's, because they're frantic, you know, they're trying to grab onto you like you're a, a flotation device. And, and you're just going, babe, you know, you go down, I go down if you hold on to me this way. So they teach you how to break that. But if you can't do it after so long and you start running out of breath, who do you have to save? Both of you going to die out there or somebody's exactly. got to save somebody? Exactly. So I have to save me. 
And when they eventually pass out, because, you know, if that's what's really going to happen, they're not just going to go and they die out. You can, once they pass out, you can grab them and take them back to shore and then do mouth to mouth and all the other stuff to, to revive them. But somewhere down the line, you have to come up with the point of who is the more important one here? And if it's you, then you save yourself. And if you've got enough energy left after fighting off this person, you grab them, take them back into shore. Um, in the last couple of minutes of the show, uh, there is something that I think we spoke about once before off air, and I will see if I can say it real short. There was a story that I learned in a seminar many, many, many years ago where there was the question, if you're a mother and you have three children and you're homeless and you're living underneath a bridge, somebody comes by and gives you some steak and a, pot- a, steak and a potato. And it's enough for one adult or you share it between your children. They would, they, in the seminar, they asked, what do you do with that steak and that potato? Do you eat it or do you give it to your children? And the person shut up and let people answer the question. And me, I was saying, there's a point to be learned here, so it's not important that I sit up here and yell through the crowd what my opinion was. So I listened. And eventually he returned and said, listen, the best thing to do is to eat the steak and the potato yourself. And a lot of people just went, oh, that is horrendous. You should give it to your children. He says, listen, your children are all under, and he did spell out the ages, but they're, say, from 10 to 16 years old. From 10 to 16 years old, if they have to live one day without eating, it's not going to kill them. You eat the steak and potato. You go out and get yourself a daytime job. And it's like uh, going to manpower servers or something like that. And you get a day job, and they pay you the same day. So you come back with $50, $60. And now you can go to the store and buy the food for your children. You can take care of your children, and you can buy something for yourself. On the other side, if you don't eat it, and you have to go work the next day, you don't have the energy to do this job, and then you lose out, and you go to the hospital. Now the state has your children, and now you have to go through a long legal process to try to, try to get your children back. So there's the reality call hmm. on that one. Okay. <laughs> so... Hmm. Do you have any comments on that for the last minute? Because we have to break here and end the show in a few, about a minute or so. Um. Yeah, I probably would have given the kids the steak and I would have eaten the potato. <laughs> but that's just me. Yeah. Because we're all getting jobs. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, think. Your children can't go out and get a job. You're the only one who can. So you take what you have. One day that they don't eat say 24 hours from that afternoon until the next day they're not going to starve they're not going to yeah they can maybe have some water someplace yeah if you're in the states you can go to a water fountain everybody will give you some water so they're not going to die of thirst they're not going to die of hunger you come back you've got money you've got food feed them so now you've taken care of yourself and now you've taken care of your children any rate (laughs) It's kind of a hard lesson for a lot of people to learn and to understand because we always think about children first, but who's going to take care of the children if you don't live? So there's your thought. Anyway, we do have to end the show uh, for today. Uh, Thank you for being with us. Thank you, Mona, for being a part of the show with me. And uh, next time we have you on, we're going to let you do more of the talking. I'm going to make sure I write down some questions for you to answer. (laughs) And uh, we hope everybody else will return. Uh, Next week, our co-host will be Pat Kammer of uh, lovesvoicechangesyou.com. You can go check her out there. And uh, tomorrow here on Freedom Talk Radio Network, uh, there is a show, and I believe it is Knights of Liberty at 2 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. London time. Um, and uh, let's see next week's show if you want to go to our website you can check them out and see what our next show is going to be about 90 seconds and um, 
Be sure to check our website. You'll hear it in the closing segment of the show here. And thank you once again for being here. Everyone take care. Have a wonderful weekend and a week ahead. Be well and take care. Thank you for joining us on Your Thoughts, Your Reality Radio. Be sure to follow our schedule, events, blogs, and more at ytyrradio.tk or ytyrradio.wordpress.com.